I have uh, been a member of Congress uh, during the increase of the debt ceiling 33 times. Uh, I have voted for an increase of the debt ceiling 20 times. Uh, I have voted against increasing it eight times. You're absolutely correct. Uh, I have uh, five times it was voiceful. The last three instances, and I'll explain, uh, I voted against raising the debt ceiling, I voted for raising it, and I voted against it. Now, okay, Pete, <laughs> are you flipping a coin here? What are you doing? The first thing I would tell you, in, and I am not suggesting this is the case today, <laughs> I wouldn't be sitting here if it was, but in the abstract, I'm talking the abstract, the cheapest vote you can cast as a member of Congress is I'm not going to vote for the debt increase. And then go pound your chest and go home and brag about it. What are you going to do about it? That's the hard vote. Part of this is very political. It's a very political debate, very partisan debate right now. To a large degree, it is the burden of the majority party. In the House of Representatives, this happens to be the Republican Party. On the other hand, if, as has been talked about here, you tie something of great value to increase into debt ceiling, I'll be the first person to vote for it. Uh, in the middle, last year, in 2010, I voted to increase it because we legislated back into law, it was repealed when Bush came in, the PAYGO rule. That is, if I want a new spending program, I have to cut somebody's program or I have to raise taxes. If I want to cut taxes, because that's an expenditure, that's a loss of revenue, I have to raise somebody's taxes or cut somebody's program. It was very inadequate because there were huge exceptions granted. Uh, there's a problem with physician reimbursement under Medicare. We continually kick that ball down the road. There was an exemption for a possible solution because it's very costly. There was an exemption for the Bush tax cuts. There was an exemption for the estate tax. There was an exemption for the alternative minimum tax. This is not a perfect world I live or legislate in. Doing something and taking that first meaningful step on everything else was worth it to me. And so I voted for an increase in the debt ceiling. The other times you're not going to do anything about it, you're just going to sit here and, yeah, talk about it. No, I got other stuff to do. But as far back as before I became a member of Congress, I can still remember a panel with three speakers, uh, one of whom, because they wanted to be even handed, was for it, one who was against, and one very academic. All three during the course of the discussion, but it won't work. <laughs> And again, all of these variations always talk about expenditures but not taxes. They talk about supermajority votes. And the fact is, you send me out there to run a government and make decisions. So one of my concerns here, Phil, is we have to start making some permanent decisions here, too. Because you, you pass the amendment, you have the ratification process. How long is that going to take? Well, hey, you, you know what you got to do. Go do it. Be a, be a man and a woman, a bond, go do it. From a technical standpoint, I just don't think it would uh, have the intended outcome. What I emphasize to people who despair and say you can't do it, I one of my Democratic colleagues say, well, Pete, the numbers when Clinton were in were much smaller. I says, yes, but the, the leverage on the changes we've made now because the dollars are so much higher in relative terms, we're talking the same game. It's just an exacerbated problem. And I again remind people, four years we balanced it in the 90s. This is not ancient history. This is not the 1920s. This is the last 15 years. And until Greenspan came up to the United States Congress and said that the surpluses are retarding the growth of the economy. And you think about what the economy looked like in the late 90s. And that was the green light for the tax cuts. And then we had deficits, and there were, there were a number, of, and, and part of this deficit is just the rotten economy. And I, I wouldn't suggest to you that that gap will only be closed by legislative action. Uh, a portion of that gap clearly is related to a rotten economy. Uh, so some of that will close, and I, I am not of the school of thought that if what I would like to see done here happens in two weeks, that 
the markets take off, unemployment goes down to 5%, and the economy just kicks in. But I do remember what the world looked like in the 90s, and I do think you instilled a sense of confidence uh, in, in markets, in businesses, in employers, that Washington came to grasp with the fiscal side of this equation as well as the Federal Reserve on the monetary side. And you know what? We might have a pretty good thing going. I'm not saying, again, that all we got to do it and it's going to take off. We're not investing enough in our infrastructure, economic infrastructure. But to make the argument that, well, I, I think we're still in a recession. I know we're not technically, we got a rotten economy. Well, you can't do it now. They said the same thing when Clinton took off it. There was a recession going on in the early 90s. Well, you better take it slow. Show people we can do something and then think carefully about the revenue and spending side and how you're going to make an investment and encourage an investment on the tax side as well. If you do not have someone who can speak with one voice, it is difficult to anticipate that an institution with 535 individuals is going to be able to do it themselves. And I do believe, uh, and, and you have seen this, and, and it is, I would tell you, it's not politics. I mean, you know, yeah, it's, poli it's human nature. <laughs> okay, you have a proposal, I have a proposal, I think I can get an advantage on you, you think you get an advantage on me, so we keep going back and forth. Well, we're at a moment now, and more or less that kind of happened in the 90s, is you have the principles in there, you hold hands, you bite the bullet, you can all be a hero. Uh, and people like me are not in that room, but certainly are trying to make our voice heard. Mr. Hoyer is in that room. I'm very close to Mr. Hoyer. I talked to him last Sunday before he went at a meeting. We had a meeting on Thursday. So you can have input. I know there are people in this party who want to go all the way. And people have to come out of that room and say, and, and I had a Jim Cooper, a Democrat from Tennessee, came up to me after one of these meetings and said, what are you doing in this room? You know? I said, Jim, you know, what I'm looking for is, is a package that there is something in there that is just almost abhorrent to you to vote for. And something in there that I would find out for. And then we all walk over there and we vote for it. <laughs> and I don't say that to be cute about it or, or uh, light about it. Because you, there's got to be something here that nobody likes. I, I don't see you. There's no easy way anymore.